Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. There are over 700,000 sexual offenders in the United States alone. With all the social media these days, how can we protect ourselves and our children from these despicable predators? Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast, where we share stories of people who experienced horrible things and try to imagine what they went through, as well as look for opportunities that could have made a difference and encourage people to help others that are being abused. After Alyssa Turney's disappearance in May of 2001, her father searched tirelessly, trying to find his daughter. He made flyers and distributed them all over town. He made trips to California where he thought she may have run away to. He kept searching, even when police seemed to have lost interest in the case. But seven years later, in 2008, a confession from a convicted murderer sparked up interest and attention that her case had never gotten before. And this new interest led to many shocking discoveries and even more unanswered questions. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. I'm Ryan. And I am Rosie. And this is part two of Alyssa Turney, uh, part two of three. So be sure, if you didn't hear last week's episode, part one, uh, episode 67, go listen to that first. If you already have heard it, you may have noticed our intro was very vague. Because we don't want to spoil anything before you hear episode one. Before we jump into it, we want to take a minute to thank Brooke from A Voice for Alyssa for reaching out to us. Because she messaged us and asked us to cover the story. And we feel it's really important because there's a lot of suspicion surrounding the main suspect who we started discussing last week. But there's never any resolution as of yet. So we're hoping along with everyone else that's passionate about this case that... You know, Alyssa's name can get out there and help make a difference in other cases, at least, if not finally get justice that it deserves. But we also want to thank Atevia Zapala from the Missing Alyssa podcast, because she did a lot of great work and research, digging into the fine details of this case and just creating an amazing serial podcast about Alyssa. And that's called Missing Alyssa. So definitely. If you want a very detailed description of this case, go listen to that, Missing Alyssa. And last but not least, we want to thank Sarah Turney for taking the time to speak with us. Sarah is Alyssa's younger sister, and she's also Michael Turney's daughter. And she'll be at the True Crime Podcast Festival this Saturday, so we'll get to meet her there. And I'm very nervous. Just in general, because there's so many people that are going to be there that like we're fans of, mm-hmm. all other people we don't really know that well. But I'm so like, nervous. I try not to even think about it, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's this Saturday. <laughs> That's probably a good idea. Yeah, I know. I'm just like we've never done a meetup or anything physical presence with other people when it comes to our podcast yet. So. Was that a really weird way to say it? We're bar- barely physically present as it is. I know. <laughs> I don't know. What my that brain means is either. melted from <laughs> sitting in my truck all day with no AC. Mm. Gets really hot in there. My brain is melted too. Oh yeah, tough day at work. Just from three boys under the age of twelve. Yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about that more later. But no need. Now let's <laughs> <laughs> let's jump back into the story. All right. Last week we discussed Michael Turney and his interesting plans for terrorism to supposedly avenge his daughter's death. Right. But we, along with many other people, believe that this may have been an elaborate attempt to cover up his own involvement in Alyssa's disappearance. So this episode will be focused on details about Mike that serve as kind of a character witness and why many people believe he should be prosecuted for the disappearance of his daughter. I'll take it away. Throughout the whole disappearance, Michael was selling himself as a loving and caring, protective father figure. He seemed to be working tirelessly to recover his stepdaughter. But, 
Like we discussed at the end of last week's episode, Michael wasn't the stable man he tried to sell himself as. He was a bit of a nut job, and after talking to other family, friends, and acquaintances, some more details about the real Michael surfaced. Many of the people that investigators talked to mentioned something really disturbing about the way Michael behaved toward his stepdaughter. One of Alyssa's closest friends gave a graphic account relating to inappropriate sexual abuse from Michael to Alyssa. Yeah, so we want to warn you, it's about to get disturbing. This guy is not only a violent, paranoid psychopath, but according to many sources, Alyssa had talked about being sexually abused by him. Yeah, Alyssa told this friend that one day she woke up to find Michael shoving a sock down her throat to gag her and started choking her. And she actually lost consciousness for a bit. When Alyssa came to, he told her not to tell anyone because they wouldn't believe her over him. He was a former police deputy with a good reputation, so that would be super intimidating. Yeah, no kidding. She would probably believe what he says because he's her father. He has all this power over her already. But, you know, if he worked in law enforcement and has a good idea of how it all works, she's probably like crap he's probably right Mm -hmm. you know that's what he told her to scare her away from telling people but she did tell people another one of her friends told the same story to police Alyssa's boyfriend told police that she told him about a time when michael picked Alyssa up from school early and they began driving then he pulled over in a deserted area and he tried fooling around with her then she got pretty aggressive with him and he did back off Her stepbrother also told a similar incident. So there's similar stories corroborated by multiple people that Alyssa confided in. But Michael claims that these were all rumors and that started after his wife Barbara died. Okay, strange, strange rumors. Yeah, so so he's saying that after his wife's death... All these things are just being said about him? Yeah, he has this idea that... um, all single dads are accused of abusing their daughters. Mm. That well, that's what he says. That there's this stereotype out there. Oh, I and haven't heard that before. He's super defensive about it, which comes across really suspicious. He says CPS came to the house several times to search it and took the girls to question them, but they never charged him for anything. And when police questioned him about it, these accusations, he got super snarky and annoying and. This is what he said. He said, where's that charge at? Maybe they can charge me with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, too. Dumb. Those are absolute lies. He sounds like such a douche, getting overly defensive, which, if you have nothing to hide, you really don't have a reason to get so defensive. But that's not even the end of the circumstantial evidence against him. A woman named Diane also came forward with something Alyssa had told her. Now, Diane was dating Michael shortly after Barbara died, and at one point, when Alyssa was nine, she told Diane that she was having sex with her dad. Now, Diane didn't take her seriously at the time, but Michael addressed this in his interview with 2020, because he brought up that when Alyssa was nine, she was going around telling people that she had had sex. Michael said he thought it was cute, and that he had to explain to her that kissing was not sex. But Alyssa told Diane, her Michael's old girlfriend, that she had sex with her stepfather. So even if she thought kissing was sex, why would she be kissing her stepfather? Why would you think that's cute if you're a parent and you're like, oh, my nine-year-old's having sex? Uh, That's really weird. I think it's because he's... uh, I would quickly fix that problem. Yeah. That's very odd. And during the search of Michael's house, they found a phone conversation Michael had recorded, talking to his brother-in-law, saying he wishes Alyssa would keep her mouth shut. And exactly what he told Alyssa was also a bit suspicious. He said, quote, If you keep pumping information out of here on assumptions, repeating some BS someone else repeated or something else, if you keep talking about what goes on in this house, none of which is that, that bad, You know it gets blown out of proportion to the point that our family is constantly being attacked, Alyssa. Then you're gone. I'm going to not going to put up with that anymore. 
I've had enough. So that sounds really threatening. Wait a minute. That phone call was to his brother-in-law? Yeah. He, but And he was telling his brother-in-law what he oh, told Alyssa. That's so odd. Why did he keep that recording? Well, we'll get into that. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Well, from what we know now, Alyssa did tell at least six people what he was doing to her, but no one reported it to the police. What's even more strange is that Michael called up CPS proactively and told them that if Alyssa ever called them and told them he was sexually abusing her, that she was lying to get a truck. So. This is so strange. Yeah, like why would he feel the need to call up CPS proactively? And more importantly, why would she make this stuff up? If it wasn't true, why would he be so worried about it, you know? So this is all circumstantial or anecdotal evidence so far, but more and more crazy information just keeps piling up about this guy. Man, that is just so strange to me. I don't get... He called CPS on his own. I was like, yeah, if my daughter says I'm sexually abusing her, she wants a truck. Yeah. That's so weird. And just to say, my daughter's lying if she ever calls you. Like, How could odd. you get any more suspicious than, yeah, that's like than asking calling the CPS? CPS to come to your house, right? Right. How interesting. And I believe they did. Well, it was pretty evident that Michael treated Alyssa much differently than he treated Sarah. Sarah was able to come and go as she pleased. He didn't really care much about what she was doing. Even though she did a lot of the same rebellious stuff that Alyssa did, she never really had to rebel because he didn't hold her to the same strict standards that he did Alyssa. According to a lot of people, Alyssa felt like an outcast. Like Michael didn't really love her, but just gave her a really hard time. And nothing she ever did was good enough for him. As an example, he would get really mad at Alyssa for drinking. But then he would turn around and buy beer for Sarah and her friends. And this is according to Sarah. So she could see herself that he was a lot harder on Alyssa. Michael justified all of this by saying that Alyssa was too trusting of strangers. And the kind of kid that he really had to watch to keep out of trouble. But according to Sarah, she was the same way. Yeah, at one point, Sarah talked about um, she had grabbed a stranger's hand in the mall. Another point, I think she got caught shoplifting. Mm. I think she talked about that as well. And, you know, Kids, Michael still viewed her as like the perfect child. From what I have learned as a child and nanny and kid, that kids, like, they need the boundaries and they kind of crave them. Well, yeah, and you got to teach them that you mm -hmm. know they don't just they don't get a healthy sense of boundaries unless you teach them you and sarah's kind of like asking or wants something you know by holding hands yeah. of strangers and stuff she's kind of saying like like give me attention you know and i guess that might say something about the situation as well you know like she's, he was so focused on Alyssa that right she's starved for attention at the same time michael would often give sarah generous amounts of money as an allowance but he would very rarely, if ever, give Alyssa money. Alyssa was very conservative with her money and didn't spend much, but somehow had significantly less money than her younger sister. Yeah, and Alyssa was older, getting closer to the age of graduation when you really start to need money. You know, so mm -hmm. this was pretty weird. He also felt that she was entitled to special help from her school, but they disagreed saying there was no information from a medical professional verifying the limitations that he had claimed that she had. Her teachers also disagreed, and her grades reflected that she was an average student with an average GPA. Yeah, but Mike decided to sue the school because they wouldn't let her be in special needs classes. Um, he wanted her to be able to ride in the special short bus, and this had to be such terrible had to have such terrible social consequences on her because inevitably the other students are going to make fun of you, you know? Mm -hmm. But he claimed that she needed this just because she had ADHD, which is odd. Right. And anyway, she started to hate going to school and she would try to play hooky whenever possible. 
Like, who wouldn't if your parents were doing that to you? Mm -hmm. But no one that knew Alyssa agreed that she had special needs. And in one of Mike's phone calls, he said that he believes special needs kids should be segregated from others. What? That's a really... That's a huge step backwards. Yeah, I'm not following that one. Like, as in they're not the same kind... They're not the same people? Are they... I don't get that. Um, Because what does that teach you about social structure in the future if you're segregated in school? Mm -hmm. But anyway, Michael claims that he paid $250 to get Alyssa tested and diagnosed with ADHD. But the police couldn't find any evidence of this anyway. But either way, like I said before, do you need special needs classes for ADHD? I was diagnosed with ADHD, and I didn't need special treatment. Like, I think those are reserved for people with more limiting conditions than just ADHD. Mm -hmm. But I suppose it depends on severity, too. But some people believe this could have been his devious way of trying to separate her from friends that she could confide in. And also justify all the control he tried to have over Alyssa. Again, this obsession over Alyssa's education was weird, because with Sarah, it seemed like he couldn't care less. When Sarah woke up in the morning, Michael would actually ask her, do you want to go to school today? And let her decide for herself. Sarah would s- said that she would probably only go to school three days a week on average when she was around 16, the same age that Alyssa was when he was obsessed with her schooling. Yeah, so again... It really seems like Alyssa was targeted for his, you know, he was hard on her. He had these great expectations of her or something, and he was just very focused on her. Um, At the very start of uh, Sarah's senior year, Michael asked if she wanted to go, and she said no. So he was like, why don't you just drop out? And she said, okay. And soon after, she got her GED and quit school. Wow. It's just such a contrast. Now, if I was in this situation, that would make me feel like crap. Like, like what the heck? You don't well, care about me. Yeah, Sarah does feel that. That's like, like, she's talked about how yeah. she sees now that she's older that it's because she feels like he didn't really care about her. Right. Back then. I mean, like, at the time, you think it's nice to have that freedom, but then you realize, oh, wait. My dad's so focused on something else, he doesn't really care about me. Yeah. I Yeah, I would have a lot of issues with this. Mm-hmm. Hmm. According to Sarah, Mike was very adamant that she never called Alyssa dumb or stupid, and he asked that of other people as well. But then he himself would call her stupid all the time. Yeah, there's even a home video, which is on Alyssa or Sarah's YouTube page, um, it's a home video of Alyssa calling her dad a pervert and then him calling her a stupid moron. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone almost in that video because why would he call her, why would she call him a pervert if she didn't have valid reasons to? Mm-hmm. And why would he be calling her a stupid moron if he was so worried about other people calling her stupid? And another person had heard him call her a retard. I hate that word. And in a recorded phone call, he called her a stupid A effing B. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, his uh, standards were very, uh, they would change a lot. Yeah. Um. So it was a lot more explicit than what we just said. Anyway, speaking of recorded phone calls, let's talk about his creepy use of surveillance. All calls on the home phone were recorded by Michael, and he also had audio and video surveillance set up around the house where he could secretly record her. So she'd be in the house thinking she was alone, you know, that reasonable expectation of privacy you have when you're in a room by yourself and you don't see any cameras, But her stepfather would be recording her. Hmm. And she didn't even know. That's such an invasion of privacy. Yeah, the girls had no idea that there was a camera hidden behind a vent in the living room. And one day, Michael showed Sarah a video that he had of Alyssa making out with a boy on the couch. Why? Why? That's so... 
gross that he would even have that or isolate it into a a video he could just share with his daughter. But at the time, Sarah was super young, so she was kind of like his little buddy with their, you know, little adventures to see what Alyssa's up to. So she viewed it all as innocent at the time. And she was always rewarded by Michael for getting Alyssa in trouble. This is so weird, this next part. (laughs) Once Alyssa was in her room with one of her friends, Sarah, who was only 11 at the time, felt left out and told her dad about it. In response, he gave her a bionic ear and said, Here, use this. You can hear what they're saying. That's so weird. It's creepy. It is. It's super creepy. And also... You can see uh, footage on Sarah's Instagram and YouTube about of Michael going to where she worked. She had a job at Jack in the Box and filming her from outside. Mm. It, it's that sounds huge. just like... Yeah, just like Yasser Said. Yeah. It's so creepy. Mm. Michael justified the surveillance saying that he was just trying to protect his daughter. And then he hid the camera in the vent because he didn't want to do any damage to their walls of the rented house. Okay, but still, why would he isolate the footage of her making out? And again, he didn't do this type of stuff to his own daughter, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Remember the footage of Alyssa fighting with her boyfriend? He had turned it into police as evidence that her boyfriend had motives against her. But seven years later, while questioning the boyfriend... They asked him what his worst memory of Alyssa was, and it was when Mike pulled him aside and told him that Alyssa was cheating on him. It turns out that Michael instigated that fight. Yeah. What so a the, monster. Yeah, this whole thing with the footage we talked about last week where um, that big fight where Alyssa broke her phone, it was all fabricated by Michael. So is it possible that he was planning to get rid of Alyssa in advance and he wanted to create evidence against her boyfriend for being violent? That's, I mean, that's kind of a theory. Mm -hmm. If so, it was a total fail because the boyfriend wasn't violent and even in that big fight where she broke her phone, nothing about his actions came across as reasonably suspicious to the police. In fact, it showed them how manipulative Mike could be. Another factor is the contracts that Mike would draft up and have Alyssa sign. Oh yeah. Mike claimed he did it and he did it with all of his kids, but Sarah disputes that. So one of the contracts was very suspicious. It said, "My father, Mike Turney, has never physically or sexually abused me at any time. And he made her sign it. So why would he need that in writing? Just like why would he need to call CPS proactively? Mm -hmm. It's so messed up. Yeah, that's the strangest thing I think you could ever make your kid do. Yeah, so now that we know Michael isn't quite the sweetheart stepfather he was trying to appear as... We're going to bring up some points from the story that we've discussed so far and point out the red flags that we kind of withheld, but that complicate the original story and implicate Michael as being responsible. First of all, Alyssa completely disappeared. She cut off ties with not only her family, but all of her friends and her serious boyfriend. So this makes her running away seem very unlikely, because who would just do that? Just cut off all the people in their life. The detective on this case said she'd have to be a sociopath to to do this. Just cut everyone out. Also, to this day, she has never reached out or contacted anyone. She'd be in her mid-30s by now. As we mentioned last week, Michael had worked as a sheriff's deputy in the past. He had a lot of knowledge about how investigations worked. So he knew exactly how to report his daughter missing in a way that would avoid a big investigation. He just simply told them that she planned to run away and where she was going, and they were too busy with other cases to follow it up. Michael had said that he picked up Alyssa from school the day she went missing, but he never told his family that it was early in the day, around 10.30 or 11 a.m. 
Yeah, they actually learned this detail while watching the 2020 coverage of Alyssa's case. So they felt a bit betrayed by Michael that he kept this detail from them. Hmm. Alyssa had saved up over $1,800 from working at Jack in the Box, which she referred to in the note. She said, I'm gone. That's why I saved my money. But the money was never actually touched. The full amount she had saved remained completely untouched. So why would she save her money and mention it in her runaway note, but not use it at all? And... Like, she said she took $300 from her dad. That That's nowhere near enough to, you know, it would barely get her to California, let alone be able to live off of it at all. Yeah, that right there is, like, a huge red flag to me. Yeah. That she would put it in the note, and she would need it. Why would she take all that time to save up her money, put it in the note, and not take it? Exactly. That's, to me, this is one of the biggest pieces of evidence in this case that prove that she did not run away. Mm -hmm. And but, then there was the fact that she left her cell phone behind. Yeah. I know earlier last week I tried to explain this away <laughs> because we didn't want to spoil the twists of the story for you. But honestly, like you said, Rosie, what 17 year old would leave behind their cell phone? <laughs> it's, her one means of contact, and it would still remain in service long enough to get to her aunt's house and keep in touch with her boyfriend, you know? She wouldn't just cut her boyfriend out of her life. So logically, it can be explained away, but it wouldn't be very rational for the thought process of a runaway. No, I'm 24, and I would never leave my phone at home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to do anything. The phone call that Michael says he got from Melissa was from a payphone in Riverside, California. Though police were able to find the call, it was only 29 seconds long. Yeah, so you'll notice we didn't mention this phone call when we talked about how she never contacted anyone because it's pretty obvious that this wasn't actually Alyssa. I don't know if 29 seconds is long enough to say all the stuff that he says she said in the phone call, especially if she claims that it was mostly muffled you know, he said that she was screaming at him right out of the gate and you know, cussing at him, telling him what a disappointment the way he treated her was. It doesn't make sense to me that she could criticize him, cuss him out, and tell him not to <laughs> contact her unless in less than 30 seconds, you know, mm -hmm. while also being muffled and hard to understand. It makes a lot more sense to me that he would have some rando call him from a payphone and... They couldn't think of anything to talk about, so they just hung up, you know? That makes so much more sense. He probably didn't think about the fact that phone calls get timed. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think you could have a phone call like that in 29 seconds? No. When you are, you know, so mad and you want to bail out somebody, you got to take your time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially if you're that far away. What do you got to lose, Right. Right. One of Alyssa's past friends talked about how Alyssa was such a bright and positive person, always looking for ways to enjoy life. But at some points, she seemed really sad. And when her friend asked her about it, she'd say she couldn't talk about it because she didn't want her family to get split up and for her to be separated from her sister, Sarah. And this same friend was no longer allowed to see Alyssa anymore after a birthday party that the friend's mom had thrown. Apparently, Alyssa's birthday was one day away from the other person whose party it was, so the mom included Alyssa in the celebration. And when Mike found out about it, he got super mad for not being told about it. And soon after, Alyssa wasn't allowed to see her friend anymore. That's so mean. I know. he. It's so obvious that he was a control freak over Alyssa's life. Mm -hmm. Just like, this is so much like Yasser Saeed, who's also is, yeah. not prosecuted or caught yet even though we know he did it a hundred percent right it's so sad not long after that mike moved Alyssa to the school she attended when she went missing we mentioned earlier that mike was always hard on Alyssa whenever she would do something he didn't like but not with sarah yeah so there was actually a time when sarah told her dad that she wanted beer for her and her friends and mike just asked her what kind and he got it 
and yet Alyssa would get punished for this type of thing. So just, you know, very unbalanced. Very much so. Mike acted as if he was he was harsh on Alyssa because she was so much more difficult to raise than Sarah. But Sarah talked about another time where she was actually arrested in a mall for shoplifting. Yeah, I guess I forgot that I put that in the outline because I mentioned it earlier, but... But still. Yeah, Sarah herself says that she was just as bad, if not worse, than Alyssa. <laughs> and yet, Mike only targeted Alyssa with his punishment. While Alyssa was working at Jack in the Box, he would show up there randomly just to make sure she was actually working. What is wrong with him? Yeah, and like we said earlier, he would take video. Like, I guess that could be normal to show up and make sure your kid's at work. Every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. But it shows a huge lack of trust, and the fact that he was filming is, you know. Oh, that's creepy. That goes to, into the Yasser Saeed territory, which makes it almost an obsession. Actually, it is an it's obsession. A, totally an obsession. It's obvious that Mike was obsessed with Alyssa. You know. Another sad detail is the way Alyssa ended up with Mike. Before she got cancer, Alyssa's mom, Barbara, had told her sister that she was miserable with Mike and that she had a plan to become financially independent so she could leave him. So Barbara wanted to get away from Mike before she died. But then after she was diagnosed with cancer, um, Barbara's father, Earl, called up Alyssa's biological father, Stephen Strom, to let him know. Stephen says that Earl told him Barbara wanted to give him custody of Alyssa if she died. But because Mike had legally adopted her, and Barbara was preoccupied with the stress from dying of cancer, she was never able to attain her wishes for Alyssa's fate. That's so sad. I know. The fact that she was done with Mike and she wanted to get her daughter to a safer household, but she couldn't do anything about it because cancer drains the crap out of you, man. Like, I'm so... She probably had no energy to worry about it, you know? It's yeah. just so terrible. But um, let's talk about the custody situation. Apparently, Mike had been a nightmare to work with for Alyssa's biological father after Barbara had married Mike. We talked a little bit about Stephen Strom last week, but now we're going to talk about an incident that he talk he claims happened with Mike. Yeah, they're pretty crazy. Stephen said that when he was visiting Alyssa at Mike and Barbara's house, Mike had kicked him through the window of his car after sharing some heated words about the way Barbara ended up with Mike. Then, Stephen was no longer able to visit his daughter because Mike had fully adopted Alyssa, but Stephen continued paying child support. Not long after this, Steve was summoned to appear before a judge and found out that Mike and Barbara had petitioned him to increase his child support payments. But after finding out that Stephen wasn't allowed to see his daughter, the judge actually decreased the child support payments. Yeah, so that really backfired on Mike. Well, good for the judge. Yeah, but this is just another example of the way Mike interacts with people. You know, at first he got violent, which there's some discrepancies in that story because um, Mike's son claims to have witnessed the whole thing and that uh, Steve tried to run over Mike with his car first. Wow. But, I mean, we weren't there, so we don't know for sure. But after hearing all this other stuff about Mike, it wouldn't be surprising that he kicked him through the window. No matter what happened, that's not the way an adult handles this kind of situation when they're fighting over the custody of a child. Mm -hmm. You don't kick someone through their car window. No, you don't. <laughs> so, the whole reason this case wasn't properly investigated is pretty much because of the assumption that Alyssa was going to live with her aunt. Alyssa's aunt Lynette lived in California, and she's the one that she would talk about going to live with. The family really didn't keep in touch very often, but... A couple of weeks before she disappeared, Mike actually talked to Lynette on the phone. 
He called her to ask if she'd be willing to take Alyssa for the summer because he was having some trouble with her. Apparently, Mike had caught Alyssa smoking marijuana, and he freaked out about it, so tensions were really high in the house. Were they really high? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good Got one. Got it. <laughs> anyway, Mike was freaking out at Alyssa, and she was freaking out about him, but Lynette kind of talked Alyssa down after this, telling her to hang in there because she was almost 18, and she could move out soon. And Lynette said it was fine to send Alyssa out to stay with her. But he never actually did. Instead, Lynette didn't hear from her again. This was just a couple of weeks before Alyssa disappeared. And knowing what we know about Mike now, both of Alyssa's maternal aunts, Lynette and Teresa, think they know why Alyssa never ended up going to live there. They speculate, based on some suspicious evidence, that Michael realized that if he sent Alyssa to live with someone else, she'd eventually tell the truth about what he had been doing to her. So, we've scratched the surface of the sexual abuse, hearing from the people that Alyssa confided in, but there was another very strange incident. David Garman is Michael Turney's nephew, and he had a personal experience to share about the Turney home. David was staying at Mike's house for a few months back in 1999 after getting divorced. He had just lost his job and had been struggling with alcoholism. He was having trouble getting back on his feet after all of this. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff all at once. Yikes. Mike allowed him to live there if he helped out around the house and gave the girls rides back and forth to school. David noticed that there was always tension between Alyssa and Mike. One day when he picked Alyssa up from school... She started crying about Mike not allowing her to go to school, to a school dance with a boy she liked. After David told her to hang in there, and that it can't be that bad, she replied to him, You don't know him like I do. And those words really resonated with David, especially when he thought back on something Mike had said to him when he first moved in. Mike had told David that at one point, Alyssa had gotten so out of hand that he had to handcuff her to a chair and gag her. What? I don't care what your child says or does. There's never a good reason to bind and gag, bind and gag a child. Like, thinking about this, this is just one incident that came out, but can you imagine what Alyssa actually had to live with? With her father? For him to be willing to share that with somebody, I can't imagine the things he's not willing to share. That's a really good point. Ugh, it's terrifying, because we know he's really manipulative. We know he's really good at covering things up and hiding things. There's got to be so much more about the way he treated Alyssa that we just don't know. I mean, prisoners are treated better than that. But... And then, and he just like, he just said it. He just volunteered the information. But there was another insane discovery by David that became the final straw for him. David was working at Sam's Club while he lived with Mike. And one night, he got off his shift around midnight and came back to the house to crash. When he got there, he felt like watching a movie. So he went through the movies in the house and found a tape labeled Dr. Doolittle. Sounds innocent enough. It appeared to be a tape of the movie recorded off the TV, not an actual commercial oh, yeah. copy. Had a lot of those as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Back in the 90s, people always recorded movies off a of TV, you mm -hmm. know? But when he popped the tape in and played it, he was shocked by what was actually on it. He saw a girl laying on the couch in the tourney home, wearing nothing but shorts and a news newspaper covering her face. She was completely motionless and almost appeared to be unconscious. That is so messed up. You know, just let that sink in, like what that could possibly be. Now, her face was covered, but David was 100% certain that it was his niece, Alyssa, just, you know, based on her frame and stature. And then it switched to another girl in the exact same pose. Topless with just a newspaper, but with darker hair. And David also recognized this girl as one of Alyssa's close friends. So, 
They're completely motionless, faces covered, breasts exposed, laying on the couch in the attorney's living room. How could this video ever make any sense? Like, it seems like Michael had drugged his stepdaughter and her friend or something and stripped their tops off, covered their faces, and recorded them. He would have had to. How else would he ever get this footage? This is so messed up. And then he hid it in plain sight on a VHS tape in the living room. Mm -hmm. Like, what? After seeing this, David packed up his stuff and left immediately. And he was furious at Mike. He wanted to beat the crap out of him, but... He left, and he says he didn't even think to report it, which... How? How did you not think to report it? (sighs) To save these kids. I know. It's insane. It's so messed up. And I think he regrets it now. He better. it's, It's so... Like, there's nothing that makes this make sense. So this instance, obviously a huge glaring red flag, and... Again, it's important that we mention that this entire scenario is based off of David's testimony. And since this was almost a decade before the investigation actually started, the tape was nowhere to be found. But based on all the other people that testified about Alyssa confiding in them, it really does seem like it's true, you know? I'm sorry. David didn't kill Alyssa or have anything to do with the disappearance. But by not showing anybody this tape that made him so scared, he left immediately? I mean, you can't help but wonder, like, dude, you're partially to blame. He's not partially to blame. I know. But he could have have done something. (laughs) Yeah, it's just so Um, upsetting because it's like, what is that? I know. It's like we can't blame him for the things Michael did but yes he he should have come forward he should have kept that tape and brought it to the police you right think away how different everything would have been if he would have brought that tape to the police it's solid evidence i'm sure that you know tears him apart all every, every day you know um but we got to remember he had a lot on his mind mm-hmm. he had just gone through a divorce He had lost his job. He was trying to start to get back on his feet. And he was, it was midnight and he had just gotten off of a long shift. So he wasn't thinking clearly. He probably, probably like a half hour down the road was like, oh, I should have brought the tape, you know? Yeah. But yeah, he should have at least come forward and reported it or something. But we don't want to rag on David too much. I know, I know. Uh, Just it's kind of it, like it is a tough. Thing. It is tough though, because this these are the kind of moments and cases that we always focus on. Like this would have made such a difference. But again, you know, it's all based off of his words. So anyway. There's one more huge incident from Mike's past that really shows the kind of family he was a part of. Mike had an older brother named James Turney, and his daughter, Renee, had an awful experience growing up. In 1974, Renee was 11 years old. One day, her mother, Donna, had come over to get some of her things. She had filed for divorce from James and was staying at her mother's house. Renee remembers her uncle, Mike Turney, coming over to their house to take her and her siblings to McDonald's. Renee could sense that something was wrong and didn't understand why Mike was coming to take them away. Yeah, and she really didn't want to leave with Mike, so she was resisting and slowing him down. While they were still in the driveway of the home, Renee heard what sounded like a gunshot. She took off and ran inside the house, making her way to her parents' bedroom. Before getting there she heard a second gunshot. She swung the door open to see her father, James, shoot her mother for a third time. So her mother, Donna, laid face down on the bed in a pool of blood with a bullet hole in each shoulder and another grazed bullet on her hip. She looked into her father's eyes and she just saw pure hatred and rage. Then James angrily punched the wall. He was expecting his kids to be gone. Renee ran back outside and asked her uncle Mike Turney for help, telling him what had just happened. 
but he refused to follow her inside. It turns out that when Donna was in the bedroom getting her clothes, James hit her really hard from behind and just started beating her over and over. He punched her for a while, then walked away, figuring he had gotten it all out of his system. But Donna got up. Then she heard him say, don't make me do this, as she heard a shot and a bullet fly through her shoulder. <sighs> and these were hollow point bullets, which explode on contact. He shot her again in the other shoulder. So the bullets literally exploded both of her shoulders, and just as he was about to shoot again, the door swung open. The door flung open so hard that it th threw off the aim and injured James's hand. So this is where her story gets a bit murky, because Renee, the daughter, remembers being the one to swing the door open and causing the last bullet to just graze down his hip. But Donna remembers it being Mike that swung the door open. We don't know for sure either way. I can't believe that Donna survived this. Like, I know. Okay, I imagine a bullet hitting one shoulder and then the other and then... Oh, man, just... Well, Donna Ooh. has theories about why he did this, but her biggest theory is because he wasn't trying to kill her. Mm. He was trying to just injure the parts of her body that she used for work. But we'll talk more about that later. It's possible that Renee was the one that swung the door open. Then, when she ran to get Mike for help, at first he refused, but eventually made his way back to the room. Donna remembers Mike propping her up and looking at her, saying, Oh, you're okay. Then Donna was... I think it was more like, Oh, you're okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, mean? Then Donna was helped out of the house by some neighbors and walked past her children crying. And here's where it gets really fishy. Mike and James's sister, Shirley, lived just a few blocks away. As they carried Donna outside, Shirley pulled up in her station wagon. Before the police or anyone had showed up, she parked in their carport and James and Mike piled all of his guns and ammo and other firearm paraphernalia into the vehicle. Shirley pulled out of the carport and just drove off right before police arrived. And just like that, all the evidence was gone. Also, you just glided right over paraphernalia. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Nice job. <laughs> Getting better every week. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Donna knew who had attacked her. But sadly, she refused to press charges. And after hearing her reasoning about this, we can't really blame her. She asked the police how long he would go to jail if she pressed charges. They told her he'd get six to eight years. She feared that James would blame her for getting him locked up. And when he did get out, he would come after her again and actually kill her this time. It's so sad that this is what deterred her from pressing charges. Like I said when we covered Mary Vincent, attempted murder is just as bad as murder. This guy tried to kill her. He should be charged as a murderer. Just because he failed doesn't make him any better. And sadly, that particular sentencing law at the time led him to completely getting away with this horrible, vicious assault on his wife. Because he would have only been put away for a short time. Mm -hmm. Donna believes that James went for her shoulders because they were essential for the job that she had to support herself in. Yeah, she was in the same kind of situation that um, Barbara was in, where mm -hmm. she wanted to become financially independent. Right, she was working towards that for years and got a job at the electric company putting cotton around wires. It required her to lift a substantial amount of weight using her shoulders. After her attack, she was no longer able to do her job. Yeah, so like we alluded to earlier, it really seems like James' plan was to ruin her life and force her to be dependent on another person. And we mentioned before that Renee and Donna remember the door swinging open differently, but my theory is kind of that both Renee and Mike came in the room at different times. First, Renee came in to see the last shot, and then Mike came in to check on Donna and collect evidence when it was time to cover it up. It's very possible Donna blacked out for a bit during this insanely intense trauma she experienced, you know? Renee, the girl who witnessed all of this at 11 years old, 
left home at 15 years old because of the abuse she suffered at the hands of her father, James. And Donna, the victim of this vicious attack, also had an extremely abusive childhood. She feels that this was what conditioned her to think that an abusive relationship was normal and why she ended up with James, the man that tried to kill her. Which makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her parents were very neglectful, Mm -hmm. and they even allowed her brother to get away with molesting her. Wow. But this attack attack we just described wasn't the first time James put Donna through something horrible. When Donna was 14 and James Turney was 17, they were already seeing each other. Donna's mom started to suspect that James was having sex with her 14-year-old daughter and told Donna that she was going to the police. So Donna went to James, her boyfriend, and told him that she was worried about it because at the time, James was actually on probation for something else. And he would have gone to prison if he was busted for that. So he started to conspire, and he remembered that Donna had confided in him about her brother molesting her. James decided he would pin it on Donna's brother. So somehow, James got Donna and her brother to go out into a field and have sex with each other. So if Donna was checked by a doctor, he could blame the brother for it. He stood there and told them what to do with each other. So another just terribly messed up thing. And this was all a story that Donna told herself on the Missing Alyssa podcast. It's so crazy. It's but that was just rough. And it's really, really rough to think about. And that was just the start of this terrible relationship, which led to what we just talked about. Donna got pregnant at 16 and married James. They had four children over the next 12 years. And when she was 28, that's when the attack happened that Mike Turney helped cover up. So, with such a dysfunctional relationship, you can only imagine the kind of crap those kids had to grow up with, including Renee, who shared what she remembers for the Missing Alyssa podcast as well. So we definitely urge you guys to go listen to that. The details of the abuse her daughter Renee suffered at the hands of James Turney aren't public, but we can only imagine that she had to endure a lot of the same kind of stuff. Yeah, if she felt the need to run away... And to this day, Renee believes that her uncle Mike was in on the attack against her mother, even though Donna doesn't believe it herself. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that one. Donna gives Mike the benefit of the doubt because he was always kind to her and would write her letters of support often. Yeah. Interesting. Which, this is all covered in the Missing Alyssa podcast, but within the letters was a lot of manipulative language, saying he wishes he could have stopped what happened, and he wishes Renee wouldn't blame him for part of it. It almost feels like Mike has been brainwashing and manipulating Donna, because even Donna knows that Mike helped cover it up and Mm -hmm. stopped her from ever getting the justice she deserved. So it's really a sad situation. But this story just shows the kind of family Mike was a part of and his willingness to go to great lengths to cover up something like this. And I have a theory, and I think a lot of other people out there share this theory with me. I'm pretty sure I heard it on somewhere else, and it's just subconsciously in my head now. But I think it's possible he picked her up early from school the day she disappeared and Much like the incident her boyfriend talked about, maybe he drove her to a secluded area and tried to sexually abuse her. Hmm. But this day, she just wasn't going to take it anymore. Maybe she threatened that she was finally going to get away from him and tell the police what he'd been doing for years. And out of fear and anger, he attacked her and disposed of her. Uh, He had from 11 a.m. to around 5 p.m. I mean, does it take six hours to get a bite to eat? take her home and then shop for a camera lens? I don't think so. And he doesn't seem to have much more to say about that six hours. He was the last person to see her by his own admission. Um, So it's just so suspicious. The same scenario could be maybe it didn't start in the car. Maybe she just told him she was going to move away for the summer and He was so obsessed with her, you know, we see that through this whole episode. He had an obsession with her. He 
was always targeting her, whether it was sexual abuse or whatever. And maybe he just really didn't want her to leave. Yeah, I mean, he didn't want her to leave. <laughs> that no matter how the story goes, we know that he was man- manipulative and did not want her to leave. Yeah, it almost seems like a, if I can't have you, no one can kind of situation, you know? This seems like a no-brainer that he did it. I don't understand why, Well, you know? <laughs> Like, that's the problem, is this is all circumstantial evidence. There's no body. But the money thing. I just, well, yeah. It, that, and that, the, uh, yeah. That's, that's why we're covering this, because there are so many things, so many little fine details. It's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, that concludes our second part. Um which this is our first three-parter because it's still a case that's very much in the works and we want to do all we can to shine a light on it and hopefully play a small part in getting this case the attention and action it deserves. Mm -hmm. Next week, we will be focusing on the closest person to this case, Sarah Turney. We'll be talking about her website and talking to her directly about the personal impact it's had on her. We'll also go into more detail about why she believes her father is responsible for her sister's disappearance. Yes, so be sure to come back for that. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that Sarah has been affected by this case the most, you know, by the disappearance of her sister and the crazy investigation or lack thereof of her father and now all the media surrounding it. It's just, it's a crazy ride for her and... She was thrown into a terrible situation. Like we talked about last week, Michael spent, I mean, he got sentenced to 10 years in prison for the possession of the firearms. So Mm -hmm. it, it was a huge impact on Sarah's life. And we will talk about that next week. But, um, yeah, that's it for this part. So thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, And again, we want to thank Sarah Turney for just talking to us and being willing to be so open with us, as you'll hear next week. We want to thank Brooke for reaching out and telling us about this case. And we want to thank, please forgive me for the pronunciation because (laughs) um, I can't do it very well. Otavia? I think it's Otavia Zapala. That's like she says it in every episode of Missing Alyssa, but I still can't do it very well. <laughs> so please forgive me. Um, but yes, she did a lot of work and research and just gathering of all the information in one place. So definitely for a much more detailed and deeper dive into this case, go listen to Missing Alyssa. So. That brings us to our review portion of the show. And this week we're only sharing one review because it's pretty long. <laughs> it is. But it, it's so nice. When we got this review, we were just like, oh. I was, wanted to tear up. I felt so good about it. <laughs> I know. It, it meant a lot to us. So it comes in from May Zine um, from the United States. It's entitled The Best Podcast Ever, and it's five stars. Rosie, you want to read it? Yes. It says, so I've been listening for about a week, and I'm hooked. I listen to them as I get ready and drive to work or just cleaning my house. Both Rosie and Ryan are professional but lighthearted enough to make the shows interesting and sometimes comical. Rosie's mispronunciations of names and words are the highlight of my day, and I have a good chuckle. But in all seriousness, they cover really tough topics and cover it with grace and dignity for the victims involved. Rosie gets the victim's story across and will leave you on the edge of your seat with her sweet and light voice. And Ryan, with his deeper, more relaxed voice, clearly has so much passion about the victims. Even with all, even with well-known cases, I still listen to every single minute because they give it to you. <laughs> Sorry. They give it to you in a different, never-before-heard story. I plan on becoming a Patreon soon. I want to support them and try to be as helpful to the show that I love dearly. Aww. Oh. That's so sweet. You're so nice. Thank you so much, Maisine. Thank you. Um, yeah, that 
<laughs> Sorry that Rosie hasn't been mispronouncing stuff as much lately. <laughs> I really thought I'd get you with paraphernalia, but... You thought wrong, buddy. <laughs> I'll have to start um, looking at a thesaurus. <laughs> see what words I can come up with. Well, I always have a hard time with the word con- conscien- conscience. I can oh. always put that. Or self-conscious. I, I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. In all honesty, today, I mean, it's going to be edited so you won't hear it, but while we were recording today, I mispronounced way more words than you did. It's, it's like choking on my tongue today for some reason. It's Monday. I'm super excited to get some tacos. Yeah. That's why. Um, do we have cat news? I feel like we do. Mm, um, well, Zucchini got out. Oh, yeah. Zuki, he's our little earless you know, Mutt. survivor cat who <laughs> he's gotten out a few times this week. But on July 4th, it was very rainy here in the early afternoon. And just before it started pouring rain, Zucchini got outside out our porch and he went underneath our back porch just far enough away from like the side where we couldn't reach him. And he just sat in the back. Terrified. Terrified, staring at us, constantly whining, meowing. Um, I got him out. Yeah, Rosie (laughs) climbed underneath the porch. Disgusting. It's where a murderer would hide bodies. He met her in the middle. What did you say? It's where a murderer would hide bodies. It's so gross down there. Gross. Yeah, Gacy. (laughs) Didn't Gacy do that? Yes. The clown murderer? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I hope I'm not me- messing that up because we have a lot of true crime enthusiasts that listen and they probably know much better than I do. But anyway, um, yeah, so if you're planning on coming to the True Crime Podcast Festival, definitely let us know ahead of time because we want to know if any of our listeners will be there so we can meet up and say hi and hang out. Um, otherwise, yeah, like I said before, I'm nervous. Or if you have any good suggestions for where to eat in Chicago, those would be helpful. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that too. Is the zoo any good there? Really interested in going to the zoo. You mean the animal prison? I thought you were an activist. I, I I still want to go to the zoo. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I mean... They seem like, well, at least the animals in the zoo here, they seem like they're taken care of, at least. Well, because I sponsor them. Yeah, Rosie does sponsor a... Lemur. A very ugly, ratty-looking lemur. Missing hair. He looks just like Zook, except skinny. And sad. That's why I sponsored him. Yeah. Cheer him up a bit. Rosie loves broken souls. All right. (laughs) Well... We should probably let you go because this episode ran pretty long. So thank you again so much for listening. Um, Yes, just be aware of Alyssa's story. Uh, Share it with whoever you can. Just get it out there. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Taco time. My missing persons case is 17-year-old Alyssa Marie Turney. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Turney. On this episode, we're going to tackle a mystery out of Phoenix, Arizona, with a lot of disturbing twists and turns. 17 year old Alyssa Turney vanished. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Marie Turney. Disappearance of Alyssa Turney. And today's a really exciting episode because we are talking about the case of Alyssa Turney. Okay, so today we are doing um, Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Turney. Alyssa Marie Turney was a 17 year old from Phoenix, Arizona. And someone reached out to me there and said, would you please cover the story of my missing sister? Um, And ever since, I have essentially been uh, in contact, I think daily, with uh, Sarah. Her name is Sarah Turney, and her sister is Alyssa. But do the clues to Alyssa's disappearance point much closer to home? Mike was watching his own children through a video camera. Alyssa had told them very graphic things, very disturbing things. Secret home movies, a warehouse app.
with evidence and a cold case that turns hot. Again, there's only two people that can confirm whether I did it. One is me, and the other is Alyssa. A family torn apart. My name is Sarah Turney, and you might have heard of my sister Alyssa's story before. Be there at the deathbed, sir, and I'll give you all the understanding you want here. Why aren't you giving it to me now? Because you got them now. But I promise that you've never heard it like this. On Voices for Justice, I'm going to dive deep into Alyssa's case like never before. I'm going to interview people you've never heard from, and I'm going to expose more about the police, my family, and myself than ever before. I'm not asking you to move forward on it. I'm asking you to acknowledge that he wasn't briefed on the case, which you're not going to do, and I understand, but he wasn't. He said that he was aware that there were no sexual allegations, which is completely crazy to me because there's over 25 people in your documents that allege this. So when he says that, I don't know what he's talking about. I've held back a lot for a long time, and I'm ready to release it on my own terms. The police told me that my best chance is media exposure, and I've been working for years to amplify my voice through others. But now, I'm ready to make some noise. Subscribe to Voices for Justice today on iTunes and most podcast players. Allegations, as you say, were people saying Alyssa said something had happened. Um, you know, he tried something, but there weren't any specific acts. Alyssa had told them very graphic things, very disturbing things. So that may have been what Sergeant Corus was referring to. There were no specific acts that anybody was aware of. Okay, whatever you'd like to say, I'm not going to go round and round. It's all, email is public record and I'm happy with that. Okay.